How did Glasgow get Doctor Who mobile? And how was the city the first place in the world where you could have your collar felt? Find out now on this episode of Astonishing Glasgow. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about some of the astonishing stories from the Cross, the Trongate and the Candle Riggs area of the city. Starting at Glasgow Cross, this is one of the oldest parts of the city and marks the boundary between the city centre and the east end. Five roads meet here, the High Street, the Trongate, the Gallagate, the Salt Market and London Road. And as well as being known as Glasgow Cross, it is also the site of Merkit Cross or the Market Cross. As the name suggests, this was the location of the city market going right back to its very earliest days. And as is traditional for towns and cities, it is marked by the ancient Merkit Cross. When I say ancient, this structure has only been here since the 24th of April 1930, when it was paid for by Dr William Black after the original cross was removed in 1659. And when I say cross, it's actually a column above an octagonal tower with a unicorn right on the top. And if you don't already know, the unicorn is the national animal of Scotland, which may be the most astonishing thing I've ever said in one of these videos. Behind the ancient cross that's not that ancient, and it's not really a cross, is the Tollbooth steeple. Unlike the cross, the steeple can almost lay claim to being ancient, as it dates back to 1626 and replaces an earlier 15th century toll booth that stood on this site. The toll booth steeple didn't originally stand all by itself in the middle of a traffic island. Up until 1921, it was connected on its west side by the toll booth building, which housed the town clerk's office, the council hall, the prison, and the debtor's prison. The court that would meet in this building would try thieves, murderers and witches and was the site of at least 22 executions by hanging. This at times proved a problem for Glasgow as it often found itself without an executioner. On one occasion, Glasgow had to pay for Edinburgh's hangman to travel to Glasgow to perform an execution and one of the expenses the hangman claimed for was a padlock so that he could lock his drunken wife in the house while he was away to keep her from going to the pub. Different times. On another occasion, with two prisoners waiting to be hanged, one of them was granted a pardon on the condition that he became the city's hangman, and I bet he didn't have to think about that one for too long. In 1814, the Tollbooth building was sold. Originally designed by Alan Dreghorn, who was the same architect behind Pollock House that you can see in episode 36, and St Andrew's Church that you can see in episode 29 of Astonishing Glasgow. Once empty, the building spent many years as a drapery warehouse, and then an auction house, but by the early 20th century, the building was empty and dilapidated, and by 1921, it was decided the building would be demolished. The steeple almost met the same fate, but when it was voted on at a council meeting, it was saved by 15 votes to 9 and survives to this day. Next door to the toll booth, just a little bit further along the Trongate, was the Tontine building. The current building shares this name but the original Tontine building was constructed in 1781 as a coffee house, meeting rooms and the first hotel within the city. It was named the Tontine building after the banker Lorenzo de Tonti, an Italian banker who lived from 1602 to 1684 and is credited with founding the Tontine system of crowdfunding. Before the original Tontine building was constructed, James Watt's workshop occupied this site. That's James Watt, the inventor of the high pressure steam engine. But history goes back even further on this site. During the construction of the Tontine building in 1781, they found ancient dugout log canoes, similar to the one in Kelvin Grove. Evidence of Glasgow's very first residence. 
The whereabouts of the actual log canoe are unknown, but it is an important link to Glasgow's history and was marked in 2001 by an art installation by Louise Crawford. And 22 years later, some of it is still in place, but it all looks pretty broken up and I don't think it's been lit up for a long time. Before we paddle our canoe any further down the Trongate, a quick request for you to hit that like button below, along with the subscribe button if you haven't already. I know I say it every video, but it really helps my channel grow. It's time for the elephant in the room. I can't talk about the Trongate without talking about the Tron steeple. And hold on to your empire biscuits, the facts are about to come thick and fast, as there is a lot to talk about. First of all, the name. Trongate. The Trongate was originally called St Thinu's Gate, as it was historically the pilgrimage route to the grave of St Thinu, who was thought to have been buried in St Enoch's Square. The full story of St Thinu will be told in a future episode, so remember to hit that subscribe button to get notified. Around the start of the 16th century, it started to be known as the Trongate, after a waybeam was erected to weigh goods for charging duty a sign of Glasgow's importance as a trading hub. Now Tron is a Scots word which derives from a Norman word meaning weighing scales, and so the area soon became known as the Tron Gate. One constant of the area is the church that was on this site. Originally founded in 1525 as the Collegiate Church of Our Lady and St Anne, it became a Protestant church after the Reformation. The tower was added in the late 1500s, and it didn't gain its spire until 1628. A fire in 1793 left only the tower standing, and the story of the fire is a real tale to tell, which we will get to soon, trust me, you want to hang around for it. But after the fire, the current church on the site was built in 1794, and named the Lay Church or the Tron Church. There are plenty of interesting details on the tower, but be thankful you don't have smelly vision, as it was quite pungent on the day I was filming. On the west side of the tower is a sculpture of St Mungo, along with the bell, the fish, the bird and the tree of the Glasgow coat of arms. Installed in 2001, the sculpture should ring the bell on the hour, but it didn't seem to be working when I was there. In 1981, the church went through another change when it became the Tron Theatre. Formed as the Glasgow Theatre Club in 1978 at the Citizens Theatre, it found its home here and launched the careers of Alan Cumming, Forbes Mason, Peter Mullen, Craig Ferguson, Siobhan Redmond and very many more. The building underwent renovation in 1999 and at this point the golden cherub was added at the front of the building and hidden round the back is this skull on Parney Street. Both are the work of sculptor Kenny Hunter. But what about the story of the fire, I heard you cry. What about the story of the fire? Well, according to the book Once Upon a Time in Glasgow by John Watson, a town council meeting of 1793 recorded that the Tron Kirk was totally burned by accidental fire, but the citizens of Glasgow knew better. It was common knowledge that the fire had been started by the drunken members of the city's Hellfire Club, determined to discover just exactly how much Hellfire they could get away with. Piling benches and chairs upon the session house fire, they had laughed and sung in the flickering light until, even in their drunken state, it became obvious that the flames were spreading along the wooden floor and onto the timber walls adjoining the church. Soon, the session house and church were ablaze, and the fire burned until both buildings were reduced to ashes, leaving the Tron steeple alone and forlorn in the grey misty dawn. Sobered by the enormity of their crime, the members of the Hellfire Club fled the city, swearing never to return. The Kirk Session House was rebuilt, and became the meeting place for not only Glasgow's first police force in 1800, but after the passing of the Glasgow Police Act, the City of Glasgow Police was the first modern police force of any kind. It was a small force, 
and its officers were expected to fight fires and sweep streets. But nevertheless, it was the first. It was right here in this building on the 15th of November 1800 that three sergeants and six constables mustered. In three reliefs comprising of a sergeant and two constables, one relief would man the office for 24 hours at a time. One duty would patrol, while the third had 24 hours of rest. That is one hell of a shift if you ask me. Especially as they were never very popular. Surprise, surprise. Another story from Once Upon a Time in Glasgow, I'm getting my money's worth out of this book, tells of the shift of J.K. Burns, and what a name. So J.K. Burns had reported for duty and had been issued with his lamp, a candle, a great coat and a four foot stave with his number painted upon it. He had marched to his sentry box at the foot of the candle rigs, called the hours at 11 o'clock, then midnight, and then had his sentry box pushed over on top of him by a roaming band of drunken weavers. Trapped inside like a corpse in a coffin, he lay in impotent rage until rescued and relieved at 4am. He then had to sweep the streets for two hours, as collecting manure was part and parcel of a policeman's lot. The sale of the dung was a major source of revenue for the infant police force. So if you think you're having a bad day at work, just think about wee Jakey Burns. Glasgow's police firsts don't end with having the first police force. In 1891, Glasgow installed the first police call boxes in Britain. They were cast iron, hexagonal and bright red, and they were a lot different to Doctor Who's TARDIS, but that would change in 1912 with another first for Glasgow, when they installed rectangular cast iron boxes. In Glasgow there are still five police boxes on the streets. There's one in Candle Rigs, not far from where Jakey Burns had his nightmare shift. There's one in Buchanan Street that now serves coffee. And in London Road, overlooking the Barrowlands Park, from Astonishing Glasgow Episode 3, is this restored police box. Now all of these boxes are called Mackenzie Trench boxes after their Scottish designer Gilbert Mackenzie Trench, whose concrete and wood boxes were rolled out in 1929. In Glasgow they would all have been painted red to reflect the first boxes of 1891, but in 1960, due to the success of TV's Time Traveller, they were all gradually painted blue. And if you look down London Road from this box, we have come full circle to the Mercat Cross where I started this video. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Astonishing Glasgow. Please hit that like button if you did. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button to get notified when new videos go live and remember to check out my other videos. If you would like to help me make more of these videos, hit the super thanks button to make a donation and every penny is greatly appreciated. These are the people who donated after the last episode. If you want to get in touch, use the comment section or visit the Facebook and Instagram pages, all the links are below. Thank you all very much for watching and see you next time in Astonishing Glasgow. Right, I'm away for a black pudding supper and a bottle of red cola. I'll see you next time.